Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Student Led Journal Club seminar. My name is Anne Marie Hayes. I'm a research associate for the Joplin campus of KCU. Um, today, I'm going to be introducing our two speakers um, who will be co presenting this talk today. Uh, student Dr. Jessica Diego is currently a fourth year medical student at Kansas City University. She is originally from Miami, Florida, where she also completed her undergraduate co career at Florida International University. For her third year clerkships, Jessica returned back to Florida and completed her rotation in West Palm Beach. She found that she enjoyed being in the hospital setting and getting to assist wow. on interesting cases. Currently, Jessica is working on preparing her application for residency, where she plans to pursue a career in obstetrics and gynecology. In her free time, she enjoys spending quality time with family and friends, often finding new places for them to eat and enjoy each other's company. Student Dr. Jamie Kayas is a fourth year medical student at Kansas City University, planning to practice in the field of pediatrics. She majored in human development and family studies with an emphasis in child life at the University of Utah, where she completed research within the realm of children's literacy. In her free time, she enjoys collecting socks and baking banana bread. So with that, I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Right. So yeah. I'm Jamie, and I will be presenting the case presentation portion of this presentation. Yes, and I'm Jessica. I will be presenting the second half uh, when we kind of go into the discussion on hypercalcemia. All right, so let's get started. So our patient was a 72-year-old female who presented with generalized weakness and confusion. Her significant past medical history was dyslipidemia, osteoarthritis, diverticulitis, and she had previous melanoma, which they resected and on her thigh. So looking at her chart before we saw the patient, she had a history of some right oral numbness two weeks ago, and she also had a toothache. So she was currently on amoxicillin for that treatment with a crown in place. So in the DD, she came in and her new chief complaint was weakness, and it had been going on for about a week. And she also had confusion. Her daughter was in town and her daughter noticed that she was having trouble finding the bathroom in her own home. And her daughter was very concerned it was not like her mom. Her temperature was only 99.8, so she didn't have a fever. And she endorsed loss of appetite and continued progressive weakness, but she didn't have any weight loss or night sweats. On physical exam, her vitals were stable, her mucous membranes were dry, and she had some oral thrush noted in the photo, but there weren't any other physical exam findings for her. When we ordered her labs, her labs that stood out were she had some neutrophilia that was critically high, some thrombocytopenia, and hypercalcemia that we were worried about. And she also received a lot of initial imaging, all which came back negative. So to start out, we consulted infectious disease, oncology, nephrology, neurology, endocrinology, and then some therapy. So infectious disease's big concern was they thought her previous tooth ache had turned into an abscess. So on top of the ampicillin, they wanted to start some linezolid to kind of knock out what they thought would have been an abscess, causing all of this weakness. Oncology was concerned about the hypercalcemia, possibly being a sign of malignancy. Nephrology was also worried about the hypercalcemia, thinking about hormones. And neurology wasn't concerned that the weakness was neurological in origin. Endocrinology was also worried about the high calcium. So our differential diagnosis were starting with sepsis and shock, um, a periodontal abscess, hypercalcemia, severe dehydration, and then the oropharyngeal candida. So her hospital course started out rough. She pretty much became quickly obtended and required ICU transfer. They placed an NG tube. And then shortly after that, she started developing pneumonia and a cough. And we had to go through, is this a bacterial cause? Do we think it's viral? Is it fungal? To rule out everything. And finally, 
determine her treatment course. Then we also had to do a lumbar puncture because of her continuing illness to rule out meningitis. And there was no meningitis found and her echo didn't have any vegetations. So the source of her infectious cause was still unknown. And this whole time she continued having weakness and confusion all the way through day nine. Um, her medications, since we had those consults, um, we started her on IV hydration to try and fix the hypercalcemia. Some calcitonin was started, Lasix just to try to lower that calcium as well. Um, endo wanted the pamaginate started. And then all of this was done and her calcium was still high at 14. And so we became more concerned and did a bone scan looking for metastatic disease and we did not find any. And then finally day six, we couldn't use medications to bring down that calcium. So we started dialysis. And we also then decided to continue with a bone marrow biopsy to continue to look for the cause of her hypercalcemia. These are her calcium trends. And as you can see all the way through day five, where we were trying just medications, her calcium wasn't improving by much. But as soon as we started that dialysis, she had two sessions of dialysis and it significantly brought her calcium back into normal ranges. So some of her other notable labs that came back, her parathyroid hormone was low, which endocrine was worried about. Her vitamin D level was within, her 25 hydroxy was within normal limits. Of note, her parathyroid hormone related protein was high both on day one and day four with significantly, it was significantly high on day four at 37. And then we also were looking for signs of, or that would point us to multiple myeloma. So we looked at her serum and urine protein electrophoresis, but there was no M spike detected kind of ruling out multiple myeloma from our minds at that time. And then we also did some flow cytometry and found a low level monoclonal B cell population. Her peripheral smear, showed a mild granulocytic shift and no circulating blasts. So it took a couple days. Then we finally got her bone marrow biopsy back and that showed that she had extensive involvement of B cell lymphoma and aggressive features and it was the large cell germinal type. So this kind of gave us our cause of what was causing her weakness, her hypercalcemia, and her illness. And so we finally knew that we needed to treat at the roots. So we started chemo with our CHOP, which is rituximab, cyclophosphamide, hydroxydanorubicin, hydrochloride, vincristine, and prednisone. And then we also found out her fish showed MYC and BCL6 rearrangements, which is common with B cell lymphoma. She also was high risk for CNS involvement because of the double hit. So when she received her chemotherapy, she had a reaction to the rituximab. She had rigor, she was not feeling well. So we had to treat her with Benadryl and Solimedrol to kind of get her under control, but she continued to have the rigors. So then we treated her with Demerol and then she seemed to be doing well. So once she rested for a while, we then restarted the Rituxim app with no further issues. So she was able to receive treatment. And when she did receive the full treatment, her white blood cell count started dropping. So we needed to bring that back up. So we started Zariaxo, which is man-made um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor to help rebuild her cell counts. And on 20, day 26 of her hospital stay, she finally was feeling better. She was no longer weak or confused. She really didn't remember anything about her hospitalization or what brought her there, but she was no longer confused and could orient to self and time and everything before she was initially confused. And on day 27, she was discharged home and 
Her calcium was stable all the way through the rest of her hospital visit at 8.8. One is what she left with, and she was tolerating her chemo treatments very well. Okay. So I'm going to kind of take over now, and I kind of want to start with talking about hypercalcemia. Uh, essentially, in this case, that was kind of the big uh, thing they found immediately when she was brought in. Her calcium levels were high, and it was kind of what led their differential to begin with. So these are the common signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. And as you can see, it kind of has a wide range of symptoms, starting from your GI system, where it can cause nausea, vomiting, pain, constipation, pancreatitis, anorexia. Uh, it also can have neuro effects, confusion, stupor, fatigue. It can have psychiatric effects, depression, anxiety, stupor, excuse me, coma again. Um, it can have some cardio effects, which aren't um, extremely common, but if it's very high, you can see them. It includes hypertension, bradycardia, QT shortening. And then um, a common one a lot of people hear about is the renal uh, symptoms that you'll see. You'll get nephrolithiasis or kidney stones, which can lead to the renal colic, but it can also cause nephrogenic DI, polyuria. And then lastly, you can get this MSK pain or bone pain. And as students, I think we're all pretty aware, aware of the, you know, the good way of remembering would be like bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. And those are kind of the ones that you see highlighted here um, as the big ones that are very commonly seen. And she did have some of that, obviously, with her um, confusion and um, pain. So here is a breakdown of how you can start to work up. A hypercalcemia and to kind of walk you through it essentially it begins by getting a calcium level and if you see that your calcium is elevated um, in some situations you'll want to go ahead and repeat that um, if some of you are third years or have been in the hospital you'll know that um, in a, a lot of settings you'll get both the or like a regular calcium level as well as like an ionized calcium level. And again, all of this is just to figure out is calcium actually elevated and to what degree. So if you repeat the calcium and it's still very elevated, you would then go on to try and figure out what the PTH level is. And PTH plays a pretty significant role in figuring out what's going on and what's causing the hypercalcemia to begin with. So if you end up getting an elevated um, PTH level, you're already kind of narrowing down your differential to consider hyperparathyroidism, specifically primary hyperparathyroidism. So the parathyroid is overproducing its normal hormone, and that can be through hyperplasia or maybe just a tumor in that, um, that organ. You, if you had like mild to an upper normal limit of PTH, you might still consider primary hyperparathyroidism. It might be just more specific to uh, the familial version, so FHH. And if you were to get low or normal levels of PTH, this is a little bit more concerning and causes for more of a workup because clearly the hypercalcemia is not being caused by an elevated PTH and there's something else going on. So from that point, if that's the results that you got from your lab work, you would then start to do more specific tests. You'd run for PTHRP, which was that parathyroid related protein, or you'd run specific vitamin D levels, um, both the 125 and the 25. So it's activated form and it's not activated form. And with those, you're again, trying to bring down or to narrow your differentials. So if PTHRP is high, you're already kind of figuring out that this might be caused by some kind of malignancy or maybe even like a granuloma disease. Um, if your vitamin D or specifically the 125 is elevated, again, uh, that could be a sign of lymphoma or granuloma disease. And then if the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, that might just be a sign of um, elevated vitamin D levels or an intoxication. So again, all of those, if they come back elevated are just more of a way to narrow down your differential. If you got all the way to the end of those labs and everything was normal with them, then you might go to start digging specifically at certain disorders that cause hypercalcemia. The big one being multiple myeloma, which is why at the end of this um, 
breakdown, it talks about measuring your SPEP, your UPEP, as well as the free light chain assay, because all of those if would be ways of finding out if someone had multiple myeloma. So this is kind of a very sim um, basic way of looking at the treatments. So you can fall into one of these three categories. Um, if you are less than 12 in your calcium levels, you're considered mild and you actually don't need any treatment. You might just avoid um, some triggers like thiazide, which is a medication known to cause hypercalcemia, but you wouldn't necessarily be giving any medications or doing um, any outright treatment for the patient. Uh, if you're moderate, which would be between 12 to 14 for the calcemia, then again, you still really don't do any treatment for the patient. However, in this case, you would want to monitor them more closely because at any point that calcium can go above 14. And as you can see, the, that would bring you into the last group, which is severe. Um, and there's a few different ways to do treatment. You can do isotonic saline, which is what in this case they first tried to do with, by giving her IV hydration. Um, and if that doesn't work, you usually do turn to calcitonin. Uh, calcitonin is like the normal hormone in your body. It causes uh, a decrease in the calcium in your plasma. So basically it promotes uptaking of calcium and would lower the levels. Um, as the picture on the side here shows, you can use uh, zoldronic acid. And this basically works specifically or more directly onto the osteoclast. It stops its um, formation, its function. So it's trying to attack a specific way in which someone might um, have hypercalcemia, specifically with bone breakdown. And again, you can try avoiding calcium containing food. And as a last option, dialysis, like we saw with this patient. So here is uh, the breakdown of what could be in your differential diagnosis if you have hypercalcemia, the most common being the endocrine causes. And we kind of already worked through a little bit of that pathway with primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, it's because of the elevated PTH. Some ways that you might see it is with the familial hyperparathyroidism as well as in men's syndrome. So those might be things to consider. Other endocrine causes include hyperparathyroidism. Um, hyperthyroidism, acromegaly, adrenal insufficiency, and a pheochromocytoma. Uh, nephrology causes or renal failure could be a reason for someone to have an elevated hypercalcemia. And this is what we call like tertiary hyperparathyroidism. It's essentially when the parathyroid hormone or the parathyroids no longer are listening to the signals that are sent from different um, systems that are supposed to like help regulate it and tell it when to release the hormone and when to stop. And in tertiary, it loses its ability to recognize those signals. And for some reason, it just starts producing PTH all on its own and it doesn't stop. So you end up with elevated PTH levels. Um, hypercalcemia of malignancy is another common cause of hypercalcemia. Uh, there are like three different ways that this can happen. Osteolytic bone and metastasis are a little bit of the same thing here. Um, the other two pathways would be like PTHRP or the high levels of vitamin D. And then lastly, there are certain medications that are known to cause hypercalcemia and thiazide diuretics being one, um, but lithium, theophylline, and then you have your teriparatide or alveloparatide. And those are both... Um, different forms of like PTH or PTHRP. The teraparatide is, uh, is a synthetic form of PTH and then the other one is an analog for PTHRP. And those are sometimes used for patients with osteoporosis. And then lastly, excess vitamin A can cause it. So we wanted to obviously focus in on the hypercalcemia of malignancy um, as a cause for hypercalcemia since that's what this patient ended up having. And we found that, you know, in approximately 10 to 30% of patients who have cancer, they end up having hypercalcemia. So it's not uncommon for someone who has cancer to have this as a warning sign or a developing symptom. And, you know, it can clue you into something going on underneath it all. And from our research, we found that, you know, multiple myeloma is the most common ca cancer to cause hypercalcemia, um, just based off of the prevalence records. So I kind of already spoke to how PTH plays this really big role in hyper, you know, the causes of hypercalcemia. And you can really see it in based off of, you know, if PTH is elevated, 
more than likely you're not too concerned about there being some kind of underlying malignancy because it's more than likely a hyperplasia or something to do with the parathyroid um, itself. Whereas if PTH levels are low, this is more concerning for malignancy and you have to start doing a, a deeper dive into what's going on and um, what's causing the calcium to go up. So this is one way in which malignancies are known to cause hypercalcemia and it's by producing this PTHRP hormone. So as the picture shows, your tumor cells will begin to proliferate and in doing so, their PTHRP um, can start to form and it can start to form um, a lot of it. And the way PTHRP works is it's able to then go down to the osteoblast and um, connect to the rank L receptor. And that goes ahead and activate osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are then, um, you know, they, they actually build up bone. However, they also are known to uh, activate osteoclasts. And then eventually what happens as more PTHRP is formed, more osteoblasts are activated, more osteoclasts are activated, and that balance that you usually have between bone formation and bone erosion becomes more skewed where bone erosion takes form. So you're going to have more bone breakdown than you will bone formation and therefore more calcium in your body. So that's just one way in which tumor cells are known to cause high calcium. So the next way is through bone osteolysis. And these are two images that are basically showing the same thing, but um, one, which is the one on the left is showing more of what happens specifically in multiple myeloma, where the one on the right is a little bit more generic. Um, and essentially what's happening here are, is that the tumor cells, instead of releasing a specific protein that's attaching to the rank L receptor, they're releasing cytokines. And these cytokines are able to either um, go to the rank L receptor, just like the protein, and activate the osteoblast, um, or they actually can go straight to the osteoclast precursor or the osteoclast themselves and activate them and get them to um, turn on. So it's, again, just another way in which um, bone erosion is going to you know, take over compared to bone formation. And one more. Okay. And then here uh, is the last way in which to, um, malignancy can kind of cause hypercalcemia, and it's through this increased calcitrol. So on the left here is just kind of a little bit of a breakdown of how calcitrol um, works in like a malignancy environment. And you can see it's it can decrease certain um, cytokines or certain um, proteins while increasing others, and this can lead to a whole change in the environment. But specifically for you know, calcium sake, uh, calcitrol is known to increase one alpha um, oxyhydroxylase, hydroxylase, which is what's circled in the other picture here. And as you can see, that comes uh, through the kidney and it goes ahead and activates the different forms of vitamin D. And in doing so, then you get increased absorption of calcium through your gut. And again, with bone formation. So this one's a little bit more of a convoluted way to getting to um, elevated calcium levels, but it does just the same. So here we wanted to show what types of malignancies are commonly seen with their certain presentations. So which uh, cancers commonly cause PTHRP and therefore the elevated calcium? And Squamous cell carcinomas of the lung, cervix, and esophagus are known to do this. You have adenocarcinomas of the ovary, breast, prostate. And then there are certain lymphomas and renal cell carcinoma that also cause this. Specifically, T-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is known to be a uh, proponent for PTHRP. Uh, for bone osteolysis, we kind of you know, discussed it in length already with multiple myeloma, but you can also have metastasis specifically from breast cancer that caused this. And underneath, I'd put two images in which um, are kind of really big pictures of uh, what multiple myeloma does and how it does its bone lysis and something that students are often called to look at. So you have that kind of like sponge or um, raindrop image of the skull with those multiple punched out holes. And then in the other image, I believe this is... Um, the humor, uh, humerus bone, and you can see where there's like that stipling off of the edge. 
And those are just common findings you see with multiple myeloma. And then lastly, the calcitrol or the increased vitamin D pathway is seen with lymphomas as well, but specifically to B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And that's also a pretty rare pathway. It's probably the least common out of the three. So it's notable to recognize some of this because if you know someone um, has a type of cancer or if you're concerned that they might have a specific type of cancer, you can kind of um, take the test or design, um, choose the test that you think would be most beneficial to getting you those answers. So if you were worried that your patient had multiple myeloma, um, and there are already, you know, x-ray images or um, symptoms that were leading you to that, you know, you can go straight away to ordering that SPEP or UPEP test and getting your answers, as well as, you know, if someone was showing signs of T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas um, and you were worried about them getting hypercalcemia, well, you might go straight away to checking their PTHRP levels because that's the common pathway that you would see with that. And then the same can be said for the B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma with the production of vitamin D. But um, we hope that this case kind of shows you that while those are common presentations, um, that doesn't mean that's always the way things work. You know, this case, we had a patient with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And when you when they checked her vitamin D levels, which according to what we just talked about, you know, with a non-Hodgkin's B cell lymphoma is supposed to go through the calcitrol uh, pathway, her vitamin D level was completely normal. And it was actually the PTHRP that was increased. So that's definitely even more rare than uh, what's normally found. So as you know, a doctor, you, you should follow what's common and look for those things, but definitely stay vigilant and do a full workup if that's what's needed, because um, the cause can be found if you're just take your time and do the research. So that's that. Yes, and then we'd also like to thank Dr. Hussein, who was my supervising physician while I was on this case. Awesome. Thank you so much for your presentation, you guys. That was great. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom. Um, or if you can't talk right now, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. Uh, looks like we have a couple questions. Dr. Joy. So lovely job, ladies, just really lovely job. Um, I have a question for you. Um, and whenever we learn from cases, um, we always have hindsight that's kind of looking back at that. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of scroll back um, to the to the beginning of the case um, where it was saying that there was, was I remember decreased platelets. I, I will admit that I may be um, multitasking a little bit. Okay, so her CBC showed um, the neutrophils were 15 um, and thrombocytopenia. Um, at that point in time, did was there a peripheral smear that was done? Do you know? Um, not, it didn't come back till later. So it's okay. in the, like the later results. At that point in time, nothing else had been there. This was just kind of what the ED had done. So this was like initially what we saw on the inpatient floor. Absolutely. I, you know, in retrospect, um, I, I was kind of thinking, it's like, oh, I wonder if I would have done a peripheral smear with those findings of thrombocytopenia and um, and hyper um, neutrophilemia, I guess. Um, but uh, um, did did that actually show the B cell, or was that was it so packed into the the um, the marrow that it really wasn't showing? Let me just look. And I know that's 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 a kind of that's not what you were looking for as far as questions. You're looking for calcium questions. You're prepared for those. But I'm just like, it, like she was in the hospital for a really long time. The smear we did get back really just showed like no, it didn't. There wasn't any blast present. It just showed like some mild granulocytic shift, but there wasn't anything that we were like expecting to find. Fascinating. Okay. Well, I really appreciate the uh, armchair quarterbacking um, the the case just to see if if they're if because twenty six days in a hospital. Um, how old was she again? Seventy. Seventy two. Seventy two. You know, twenty six days in a hospital for a seventy two year old. You go home and you can't do anything. You know, you spend yeah. a day or two in the ICU and and 
you know, you haven't gotten up, you haven't moved, you haven't even been able to empty your own bladder. Um, that's, that's devastating. So, um, so that's a really interesting case. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Um, Dr. Stoddinger, did you have a question? Yeah. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So great job. I appreciate all the work you put in. Um, I also would like to ask, not only was it a rigorous mm, hospital experience for this elderly female cancer patient, she underwent some major chemotherapy. Um, what is the effect of chemotherapeutic drugs on calcium levels that she endured, the, the chemotherapy she endured? I, I think I know that some of these drugs do target calcium signaling and the role of calcium in uh, B-cell development or differentiation is also an interesting topic. So I put, you guys taught me so much uh, in the practice session and here today. So I did a little research and I dropped a, an article in the chat that reviews this very topic. If you guys can double click on that, you'll see uh, that article. But thank you, thank you again. And the question is, do any of the drugs that she uh, took affect her calcium level or calcium signaling per se? Jamie, do you want I'm not 100% sure of an answer for that, but I can look it up. I know that once we did dialysis, her calcium le levels stayed stable even through like the 27th day. So as far as what we saw once she received her chemo, her calcium levels didn't change significantly, but I'd have to look at specific, um, specifically each chemo. Just, just an anecdote. Um, in graduate school, while I was at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital, uh, I worked in a lab and the, the, the PI said the following sentence, and it's always stuck with me. Well, calcium, of course it's calcium. Calcium regulates everything under the planet. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with Jamie. I'm really not too sure specifically if the chemo drugs um, affect calcium, but it would not shock me if they did because um, it, you know, as we showed through those pathways, it's really involved in a lot of different things and even certain cytokines can just set them off. So, um, you know, I'm more aware of how chemotherapy drugs are affecting her immune system, but um, it, you know, the prednisone and things like that. I mean, prednisone also has a pretty wide factor of affecting different things and setting them off. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if some of those drugs um, are known to also uh, trigger calcium levels. There's no question in some of the, um, uh, in particular, the review article I put in the chat, that it's targeting calcium dependent signaling pathways. It being certain chemotherapeutic drugs do target specifically calcium dependent signaling pathways. And, and I was going to say with 10 to 30% of patients showing hypercalcemia, there probably are drugs out in the market that are known specifically to affect calcium um, because of that. You know, it, it's not something that's unheard of in these types of patients. So they're probably aware that this might be happening. And instead of, you know, I know in one hospital, they didn't want to use calcitonin all the time because um, that wasn't necessarily good for patients either. So, you know, they're trying to find other ways to combat it. Thanks again. Any other questions, comments? If not, um, again, thank you so much, student Dr. Kayas and student Dr. Diego. Uh, wonderful presentation. You guys did amazing. Great presentation, ladies. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you.